do, you can say it again for the day. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Seth, for sharing some time and inviting me. Um, my name is Keith Morris. I am the founder of Willow Crossing Farm in Johnson, Vermont, a farm in the floodplain of the Lamoille River Valley. Um, also, I work with a variety of other farms, essentially doing uh, farm infrastructure design build. So we do everything from windbreaks, hedgerows, riparian buffers, uh, greenhouses, tiny houses, farm uh, added value processing facilities like kitchens, etc. cetera. Um, and then also I teach about the farm design and helped develop a farm design program with the University of Vermont, Sterling College, um, St. Mike's, Paul Smith's, and uh, elsewhere. So uh, a few things uh, I might like to add to this conversation. Um, first of all, it's very exciting to see regenerative agriculture um, <coughs> joining the conversation of legislation. Um, the, the pending bill in the Senate is exciting. Um, I have um, a, a support of that bill and also some feedback, I think, from, from growers about some of the specifics of that bill. Um, I may need some clarity as to the difference between the bill pending in the Senate and this hearing in the House. So, you know, guide me where necessary, how, how my testimony might be most relevant. But um, I, I um, um, as you know, there's a bill pending that essentially is looking to create a certification for regenerative farms uh, that would be essentially a marketplace identification for products on the shelves in the supermarkets. Um, I think that bill has incredible promise. I'm in support of that bill, but I think we need to go above and beyond that in incentivizing regenerative farming. Um, soil, obviously, is one of our most important um, and certainly by volume, our greatest potential sink for atmospheric carbon. And uh, regardless of um, what room there might be for opinions as to the source of this carbon, uh, there is no question that we're seeing dramatic increase in atmospheric carbon and that it is having dramatic impact in the behavior of climate. Um, um, beyond soil, of course, we see the benefits that Seth mentioned in terms of you know, nutrient density of crops produced, erosion prevention, um, reduction of pest and disease pressure in our plants. Um, but of course, the economic value of measuring soil and soils increase and soils organic content increase are far above and beyond benefit to simply our farmers. Um, when we look at the increased incidence of severe weather events and, and the, the um, essentially the, the, the increased frequency of flooding events, and I'm sure most of us are very familiar with our history here in Vermont, as well as the incredible, beautiful soils that we have throughout our, our river and lake floodplains all over the state. Um, we need to protect our farms first and foremost, perhaps, but also our communities in general and our highways and railways and downtowns that built around mills and um, waterside ports. Um, when we look at the potential for uh, water absorption, when we look at the potential for carbon absorption, um, I think we start seeing just infinite um, pluses to this, this idea of regenerative farming. Um, and that's what's so exciting about this legislation, that's what's so exciting about this consideration of this topic, is we're not really looking at um, a risky uh, solution, such as you know the, the, the efforts to control the weather by way of uh, chemtrails, which I know sound, makes me sound like a conspiracy theorist, but of course, I hope most of the folks in this room are, are educated enough to know that we are in fact experimenting with seeding clouds and otherwise looking at very extreme and high risk measures to deal with this reality of climate change. Um, beyond the potential for soil to sequester carbon, of course, is our potential for tree crops. And that's in particular where my expertise is and in my particular experience in farming in the floodplains. Um, we have for over 15 years been focused on experimenting for tree, tree crops in Vermont. Um, including over three dozen species of nuts, plums, apples, cherries, pears, 
yes, even peaches in Johnson, Vermont, which um, <coughs> I certainly wouldn't be placing all of my um, money on peaches if I was a gambling man, but we have in fact grown and eaten peaches in Johnson, Vermont. And it's very exciting, not only for the potential crops and added value and diversity in our food system, but most importantly, the resilience of our food system. Um, when we start looking at incentivizing perennial crops, we look at dramatically reducing soil disturbance, which is kind of the centerpiece of the regenerative agriculture bill, but also have crops which, while they may have significant financial outlay in the beginning and a not as predictable short-term return on investment, like a farmer who might you know, sow their seeds in the spring and have a very good estimation of what yields they might get that fall, um, we have, in the case of nut trees, for instance, um, crops that are bearing for generations. And, you know, people laughed at me when I started planting nut trees at commercial scale in Vermont 15 years ago. But in fact, now that they are bearing, um, I wish that I planted many more. Um, and one of the biggest crops for us has become nursery plants because so many other farmers are interested in the variety of nuts, fruits, berries, vines, and other perennial woody crops that are potentially viable here in Vermont. Um, these are, are entirely compatible within and around um, vegetable operations, grazing operations, um, and especially in the case of our floodplains, can physically buffer us from the effects of ice and flotsam and damaging floodwaters. So, um, I, for one, would love to see the regenerative ag conversation expand and look, in addition to soil, to the potential for carbon sequestration in trees and tree crops in riparian buffers, um, and to otherwise incentivize no-till um, or other forms of perennial agriculture which minimize disturbance in soil, increase soil organic matter, and have an invaluable and unmeasurable service in protecting our riparian communities, including almost every pop well-populated town in the state of Vermont. Um, and we do that not only by way of carbon sequestration and, and resilience in that regard, but of course in the economic resilience of crops which um, bear indefinitely for decades, as well as physically preventing soil erosion and nutrient loss, of course, a whole other part of this conversation is what we're really talking about, of course, is all our watershed, uh, our water quality goals and our watershed concerns, in addition to, you know, flooding, but of course the nutrients that we're losing in our, in our waterways. Um, when we start looking at these <coughs> various problems, very few solutions start speaking to all of these problems collectively. And regenerative agriculture is, is one term that we might use to this, this solution set that starts speaking to water quality issues, that starts speaking to soil <coughs> erosion problems, that starts speaking to nutrient density, that starts, starts speaking to economic viability of farms as we see um, um, increased interest in local, local agriculture and an increased interest in diversity of crops coming from our local agriculture. Um, so there's a lot that I'd like to add, um, but I want to make sure that there's time. I know that I, I showed up a little late, so I'm not sure where we are time-wise or what. We have about uh, 25 minutes left. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> perhaps this is an opportunity for questions, and, and that may trigger where what more I have to add could be most relevant. Um, okay. Could, could you say the name of your farm? Again? So my farm is Willow Crossing Farm. It is um, where the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail historically crossed Route 15, and that was the historic name for that area. Okay, and what, what's the, um, what, which is the town you live in? Um, so my farm is in Johnson. Okay, I live Johnson. in Jeffersonville, which is adjacent. Okay. Um, what kind of nut trees are you growing? <coughs> yeah, so I mentioned that we grow over three dozen species of nut trees, which is really exciting when most of us don't realize that you can even grow nuts in Vermont. Of course, some of them are classically, historically, incredibly important to Vermonters, like butternuts and walnuts. The most promising as a crop is hazelnuts in, uh, for a number of reasons. One being it is the shortest return on investment among nut trees. So 
It is true, in fact, in the case of butternuts, walnuts, and other um, what we call juglins, uh, that you're looking at 10, 12, 15 years before you see yields, which is the main reason that we aren't seeing more farms investing in them. Um, the hazelnut, however, we're looking at three to five years before we see yields. Um, and we're seeing um, an incredible demand for hazels. And again, as I mentioned, the nursery has really become one of the most important fruits for us because so many other farmers are looking to, hazels in particular <coughs> are uh, in the birch family. So they're very resilient. They're multi-stem shrubs. They make excellent windbreaks, hedgerows, livestock uh, living fences, if you imagine, you know, the classic English hedgerow with the sheep pastures delineated by these these you know impenetrable hedges through which the sheep can't pass. Those are all hazels. Um, uh, we also uh, experiment with pine nuts, uh, chestnuts, um, and a few other less common and or more experimental species. But I'd say you know if you wanted one that has the most promise for a significant crop in Vermont, I would say hazels by far. The walnuts, butternuts, and all of the various hybrids of those um, are even more economically exciting, but over a much different time frame. Um, and that is also to account for the most valuable hardwood that is able to be grown in the eastern forest. Um, so when we start looking you know, at the multi-decade time scale, um, I'm sure you folks know that you know a single uh, walnut can sell for over $50,000 that in the Midwest, people find these trees during the day and come back at night and steal them with helicopters mm -hmm. because of their incredible value. Um, they also can be tapped for mm -hmm. syrup. All of your walnuts, butternuts, and their various hybrids have an incredible potential in um, the syrup world. And of course, the woodworking, the they are one of our most heat yielding firewoods, and that is because of their unique phenomenon of atmospheric carbon sequestration. When we look at all our traditional ax handles and things like that being made from hickory, which is in the same family as the walnuts and the shagbark hickories and pecans even are being grown here in Vermont. Um, this family of trees creates a very, very complex carbon chain and that's why the tool handle will bend and not break. That's why you go to the hardware store, the best axes and wooden handled hammers are all hickory. And that's also why they yield so much heat as firewood, because while they're growing, they are packing carbon in incredible quantities. Um, so of course, they're very promising from the climate change and climate, um, the atmospheric carbon mitigation perspective as well. <coughs> you know, um <clears throat> My son has a, a walnut tree on his property in New York State, and uh, it's quite an ordeal to actually mm -hmm. get the walnuts yeah. to be edible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's a whole process running over with tractors and not yes. the tree, but the yeah. nest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. obviously. Can you talk a little um, bit about that and yeah. how it's economically viable? Yeah, um, it is a function of scale to a degree. Obviously, it's um, very economically viable in California at the moment right. for commercial walnut production. Well, whether we can continue to count on California to produce the majority of our food and for how long, I think is a question in and of itself. Um, the, um, uh, the walnut processing um, of the walnut that I presume you're speaking is a black walnut, which does have incredible potential value but what's considered, what's called the English walnut yeah. is much more easily processed and much more commonly commercially produced. Okay. Um, we, in northern Vermont, do grow this tree and it survives. It is an experiment um, in places closer to the Champlain Valley and southern Vermont. It is much, le the English walnut is much less experimental. Of course, we can look at both sides of the coin in terms of climate change. And while in no way do I mean to say we should be excited or, or, or joyfully anticipating a longer growing season, um, the fact of the matter is that is at play in um, things like the chestnut and the English walnut and my peaches. Um, and again, I don't think we can consistently predict you know, that we'll have, climate change doesn't necessarily mean simply uniform or benign warming. Um, in fact, I think we'd be much more accurate to describe this phenomenon 
as climate chaos, right? Um, a, an unraveling of the patterns, um, which is where it's at, you know where it's at risk to our maple syrup industry, um, and which is why, in, in my philosophy, we want to you know if we were to pe be playing Yahtzee, for instance, you you roll six dice to try to get six of a kind, right? Um, I'd like to try to roll six of a kind with thousands of dice. And, and we literally are experimenting with thousands of species, relatively new or not new at all, in, in indigenously important to Vermont. Yeah. So. It's, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to grow cotton. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, questions for Keith or Carl or Seth? Yes, Terry. Uh, you said you were excited about uh, <coughs> this, the new program. Uh, I wondered yeah. where you got your information before, did UVM have any for you or when you say the new outside. program um, do you mean the, the, the pending regenerative agriculture bill um, well just your whole farming experience okay um, uh, did you get all your information outside or experiment or did did UVM help you out yeah now? unfortunately um, I wish UVM was doing much more by way of tree crops um, right now there is little to no incentive in tree crop farming um, offered by way of the NRCS or university research extension programs, um, unless we're very creative. Um, and of course, there are some programs for riparian buffers, riparian reforestation, which is very exciting and, and well-intentioned and does meet many of these benefits in terms of preventing nutrient loss and shading streams for fishermen and carbon sequestration and habitat. But right now, all of our riparian reforestation incentive programs explicitly prohibit any production whatsoever in our riparian buffers. And that comes you know, well-intentionedly from <coughs> folks who are growing corn right, into the, right over the banks and folks who are grazing animals right into the rivers to kind of push back our, water side, our water's edge and say, hey, these are, these are precious ecological places. We, we shouldn't be farming here. The reality is when we look to potential for tree crops and um, booming industries in Vermont, like elderberry production, for instance, um, these are compatible with all of our conservation and water quality goals while allowing farming closer to our river's edge or in our floodplains. Um, so yes, there's, you know, um, if, if nothing else, UVM has afforded me the opportunity of, um, you know, reaching students who are doing relatively you know small papers or, or seeking out what what work is being done out there um, but I would love to see the university and our agricultural extension programs go tremendously further in not only tree crops but carbon farming in general um, I'm not sure if it already came up or if folks are familiar there was a big article in the New York Times just a few, a few months ago now about carbon farming and carbon farming's potential and essentially the author of this article who is paying attention to what's happening in, in the Paris Climate Summit and their incentives to, to you know, uh, first measure and then incentivize uh, carbon, atmospheric carbon sequestration in soils and tree crops and hedgerows and riparian buffers, et cetera. Um, the, sh the, the summary of this article was, this will be the primary consideration for agricultural subsidies in the for the remainder of this century. Um, so I, I think Vermont is in a very unique opportunity in our close-knit relationship between farmers and legislators to really be a vanguard and lead the way and figure out the details of how this works, which is, which is why, while excited I am by the regenerative ag bill, I think we have a lot more work to do, and I think this is the beginning of many conversations around this topic, a, a, a more broad topic perhaps of what we call carbon farming, which includes, of course, agroforestry and um, biochar and um, holistic management and carbon sequestering grazing practices, um, which is very exciting too, as, as you know, we heard the story of how atmospheric carbon is sequestered in soils. I think it's very important in Vermont's agricultural economy to note that properly managed pasture is one of our best conduits of atmospheric carbon into our soil, whereas um, um, uh, other means of dairy farming can actually be, of course, incredibly carbon emitting. So, um. Questions? Yes, Steve. I've always been concerned how you grow 
trees in a floodplain, what do you do to protect them from the ice and physically yeah. being killed within two or three years after planting? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. So um, the best thing that I do is plant trees, <laughs> and I plant much less valuable trees immediately adjacent to the river's edge. Um, trees that I pay nothing to um, propagate, like willows and red osier, um, which are literally you're able to cut and stick into the dirt at the right time of the spring and they'll grow. Um, I absolutely uh, have buffers to my buffers, and that's, that's part of our work in 15 years of experimentation of this, was you know I sort of started out like, ooh, let's plant very high value fruits, nuts, berries, vines, and did in fact see trees destroyed by icebergs or you know, literally just sucked out of the ground when um, they weren't adequately planted to spring right before some spring flooding occurred. Um, however, when we contrast that with um, tillage agriculture, which, which certainly has, you know, um, uh, a time and place and an important role in feeding us, um, but of course, as we know, during Irene, we saw some of our annual vegetable agriculture operations literally washed away to the underlying bedrock. Um, so, um, a very, a ver and when I grow tree crops, um, some of my plantings might look like we imagine an orchard, especially some of our more production oriented plantings, but most of my plantings are incredible diversity of plants, many of which are not as immediately valuable to me, such as nitrogen fixing plants. Uh, like our, our, our black locust is a perfect example of another one that is in, uniquely valuable in its, in its ability to sequester atmospheric carbon and to grow incredibly fast, right? And, and if any of you are familiar with the black locust, we're looking at a tree that grows over 20 feet in just a, you know, a handful of years, four or five years. Um, these trees are what I plant in my most flood prone areas and, and literally as a defense um, uh, buffer from, you know, we have certain areas that we observe where we see flotsam and icebergs and things like that. And in fact, this protects the areas where we do do more conventional tillage production. It protects my infrastructure like greenhouses and things like that. Other questions for anyone in the room? So uh, I do have a question about Osher. How's the what, what's a good source for osier? So, well, wherever <laughs> you see it, you can cut it, yeah. and it's one of the most easily propagated plants. Yeah. Um, there certainly are um, conservation nurseries. Um, the Intervale Conservation Nursery is probably our best um, business that we may look to within the state of Vermont. And again, where we see unending economic opportunity in this. Um, Right now, with all of these buffer programs as limited and, and constrained as they are, almost all of them, I'm sorry I don't have an exact statistic, but I'm certainly we could find the vast majority of these trees are purchased from places like Montana, where most of our wholesale nurseries are. And the Interrail Conservation Nursery is one example. Um, I know for a fact, sells out of its stock every single spring. Um. Great, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Jay. What year did you found soil for climate? 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned chemtrails, and then it seemed like you were trying to... I use that as a realm. euphemism for the very real experimentation in um, experimentation right. in weather control. So you said, I hope that everybody around the table knows that what I mean by the word, what, what, what I mean is that we are actively experimenting with cloud seeding. Mm -hmm. yeah. what is, what, can you expand on that? What is that? I'm certainly not an expert in that. No. Um, but I don't know, Seth, if you'd like to <coughs> add anything. Carl is the chemist of the room, he'd be happy yeah. to jump in. Oh, thanks. <laughs> sure. There, um, uh, with conspiracy theories uh, being ever so popular these days, it seems, um, there's a segment of the population who feels or believes that essentially all commercial aircraft flights, every time they go across the sky, are disturbing chemicals throughout the atmosphere, in some cases for mind control reasons. So, Which is um, why there was a big asterisk next to the phrase. Right, right so, right. so yeah. chemtrails is a loaded term. Um, weather modification uh, has been experimented with at least since the 1950s during the Cold War. It was thought that if we could disrupt 
uh, Russia's um, growing season, and you know that would give us an agricultural advantage or um, the, with the agricultural gap, I guess, what they would call it, as opposed to the missile gap. Um, in fact, some of the earliest computers that were developed at MIT, uh, one of the earliest ones was called the Whirlwind, and uh, it's specifically it was to uh, help understand weather patterns better, in fact, for the potential role that disrupting the weather could play in, in giving us a military advantage. So, um, uh, as Keith said, um, there is uh, a number of, there are a number of programs around the world, in some cases uh, from the ground, there are projectiles launched in, you know, into clouds, uh, you know, that will burst open at the right altitude and, and help disperse particles. Uh, essentially, raindrops form whenever there's a little particle of dust in the air. You need something to coalesce onto. So by putting more particulate matter in the atmosphere, uh, there's evidence that you can increase rainfall locally in certain areas. Um, what, um, what, um, well, David Keith, uh, a, a professor at Harvard, um, that's not really cloud seeding. Uh, his approach is... But it's still part of geo it, It's, yeah, stratospheric um, dispersal of uh, engineered aerosol particles that essentially would act as tiny mirrors and uh, the purpose for that is to reflect sunlight at certain parts of the world. Um, I've, I've never been a big fan of adding more pollution to the atmosphere as a way of dealing with the pollution in the atmosphere, uh, but with reports coming back of the Arctic being now in some cases 30 degrees or warmer above average, uh, I'm not quite ready to, um, to rule out, in fact, that we may have to do some programs of that kind you know, on a limited basis. Um, and uh, the, the approach that that, that we're promoting here by capturing more of the rainfall. Uh, there's a term in regenerative agriculture called uh, called effective rainfall. Uh, you know how much water a piece of land retains is based purely on the carbon content of the soil. In fact, there's an expression that water follows carbon. So by increasing the amount of carbon in the soil, as Seth and Keith have mentioned, we can essentially use more of the rainfall that we're getting. And this we would see as a far more preferable alternative than uh, than trying to see clouds and so forth. Does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah, um, I guess. Uh, who, who's responsible for that? Though? Uh, uh, for who, who does that? Um, the effect of regenerative agriculture, or you mean the cloud seeding and so Yeah, the, the cloud seeding. From what I've heard and uh, what I've read, I've read a little bit about it. Um, I believe it's more common in China than in other countries around the world. I don't know how much is, I'm not up to speed on what the research programs are, but I could look into that if that's something you're interested in. If I can say something here too for clarification. And so, Seth, if you could just say your name. Uh, really my name is Seth, it's Canada Soil mm -hmm. for Climate. So there's a whole uh, car cartel of, of, of methodologies which we don't approve, um, which is sort of the geoengineering cloud seeding, chemtrails, whatever. Uh, uh, but there's also the, the, the iron the, uh, the the iron fertilization in the oceans to create algae blooms, because that's drawing down carbon, but you're also creating eutrophication. And so uh, these, are, these are extreme measures, but what you need to understand is people are seriously getting behind these because they realize how desperate the situation is. And, and there's already big money, you know, Google David Keith, um, um, you know, major professor in the Boston area is advocating for this. And he's clear to say, he says, look, I'm only advocating for this because it's an extreme situation, but extreme situation is dangerous. On the other hand, a lot of those people aren't aware, aren't pay, uh, paying attention to much less risky, much friendlier solutions of just doing better agriculture. And they're, they're just sort of looking past that because it's not in their paradigm. They just, everything has to be a technology solution. So agriculture, we're saying agriculture is not only has the largest potential, but it's also the safest, and there are so many other co-benefits to it as well. We just have to start getting the language right, terms like carbon farming, carbon drawdown, regenerative agriculture, soil carbon, soil organic matter. You know, most people don't know these terms, but these are the terms that have to start to get out into, into culture. If I could follow up on, on Seth's comments uh, briefly. Sure. Um, Just uh, say your name. Yes, Carl Tiedemann from Soil for Climate. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to share um, briefly a poem. It's called Climate Farming. So what's the future? Is there no hope? Healing the land can help us cope and grow better food with less flooding too. Put carbon in soil is what we must do. Draw down the heat, slow the sea rise. Let birds and bees thrive in the skies. Good farming is how we deal with this mess. Now the climate's fixed, what's next to address? <laughs> John has a question. Um, a couple times it was mentioned uh, of algae blooms in the ocean uh, sequester carbon. 
How does that actually work then? So if you've got the, I mean, I, I get the carbon is in, in the algae, but when the algae bloom is over and the algae died, is the carbon released back it, in the atmosphere? It, or is it? The idea is that it sinks with it. It's, it's it sinks uh, into I mean, it's photosynthesis, which is a good thing. You want photosynthesis. But it, it's literally a way of trying to kind of fool nature to, to grow algae where it wouldn't otherwise and then and sequester it into the deep sea. So yes, it is a sequestration methodology. It, it will but work. reserves of the future. Um, but it's highly yeah. risky. And you know, yeah. it, the, the thought of doing that, it just shows how desperate. So it isn't know. just released into the atmosphere again. It's I mean, not, 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 not in this case, but then anyway. Uh, a, lot, a lot of this is on there. You Google geoengineering, and you'll see that all these methods that are explained that and, and, and they may even talk about artificial trees, whereas just just better agriculture will be you know, entirely missed, so we're trying to counter that. And if, if I may, uh, there are chemical ways, industrial ways, if you will, of uh, Carl Tiedemann from Soil for Climate, there are chemical, uh, industrial chemical ways of removing carbon from the atmosphere, and, and David Keith, who in addition to his work with the uh, aerosol uh, sulfur particles, uh, is also has a, a company uh, that is developing essentially factories to take carbon out of the air. Um, on the geoengineering uh, Wikipedia page, I learned recently that what was called the first industrial scale facility of its kind to take carbon dioxide out of smokestacks um, had uh, just been recently brought online. And I was curious to see well, what is the capacity of this plant? And it was reported at 270 tons of carbon per year. When I saw that, I, I think I laughed out loud because that's equivalent to what you could do with a 300 acre farm. I mean, how many millions do they spend, you know, building this facility? Mm -hmm. With that, I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions for any of our guests? All right, if I can make a sure, comment. absolutely. If um, you just say your name. Yeah. Uh, my name is Emily Liss. Um, I live in Brattleboro. Uh, I'm not affiliated with any organization really, but I have been a historian and a farmer and a farm educator, uh, and most recently in the last several years also something of a self-taught student, learning a lot about regenerative agriculture um, and soil science, something something of a hobby, honestly. Um, and I just wanted to say a couple of things. That First of all, you know, I, I was born in 1989, so I very much grew up with the threat of climate change hovering over my head for pretty much as long as I can remember. And I remember being in seventh grade and learning about climate change for the first time, just being like, no, that, that's too scary. Pretend it's not really true. Um, and I spent a lot of time sort of trying to ignore it. And as I got older, I realized, no, this is real. Like, this is horrifying. Like, my generation is screwed, to put it lightly. Um, and learning about the potential for carbon in soil has been the one thing that has been truly exciting and truly, you know, bringing hope. Um, and I just want to say, as somebody of the younger generation, this is so exciting for me. Uh, and I also just wanted to add, <coughs> I read about the um, regenerative ag bill that was went through here pretty recently, and I want to say that I was really excited about that. But I also wanted to add, along with Keith, that I think it needs more as well. And I think what I want to add to it is I think it needs incentive, but it also needs education. It needs education on the sides of farmers, but it also really needs education on the sides of consumers. There's no point in having a billing act if nobody knows what it means. Nobody knows how important it is and what it's really doing for our economy and our climate. So I think education is really the thing that we need to add. Thank you very much, Ellie. How do you spell your last name? Liss, L-I-S-S. Thank you. Great. All right, we were are just about out of time. This has been so interesting. We really appreciate all of you making the trip here. Good. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you all. Very much appreciate your time. I know how far Brattleboro is. Yeah. Bye. So thanks.